All right, so we are finishing up the book of Acts. We've been in, in the book of Acts all year long, and we finally come to the last chapter. I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling like I'm losing a best friend here as we move on to, to another part of Scripture. Uh, but we are going to close this out, and I hope that you've enjoyed the journey as we went through the Acts uh, of the Apostles and seen the Holy Spirit move and work and, and the church grow and uh, the, the gospel accomplish the mission. And so if you would stand with me for the honor of reading God's word, we'll start in verse 17 of Acts chapter 28. It says, After three days he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered, he, sailed, he, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of our brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you, but we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect we know that every, everywhere it is spoken against." And when they had pointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in great numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, you will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen." He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your word this morning. And, and Lord, as we have went through this book, and uh, I pray that it has been a, a life-changing experience for us, that we have seen the truths of your word and and. I ask that as we close this out, that this last message in this, in this special book, that we would hear what you want us to hear so that we can do what you want us to do and be the people you've called us to be. So help me to preach plain and clear today, Lord. I do understand the judgment on my life and rightly dividing your word of truth, and I accept that place. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray and his name that I preach. Amen. Amen. So in, in, in verses 11 and, and 16, Paul finally made his way to Rome. And over the last several weeks, we've been looking at Paul's uh, route to Rome, how dangerous it's been, and he just, by shipwreck and by a lot of trouble, he finally makes it to Rome. And when he gets to Rome, the whole reason we've been seeing him get to Rome is that he appealed to Caesar. And as we read this last chapter here in, in the book, uh, one may think that it's kind of left with an odd ending. I don't think it does. I think Luke masterfully ends it well. But uh, it doesn't say anything about Paul's trial before Caesar. And, uh, and so one wonders, you know, why don't we get that, that story? And there's many thoughts of, of that. And, uh, and several believe, as, as I believe, that, um, that Paul was released uh, after two years. And he had the opportunity to go to Greece as far as possibly Spain, and then after Nero burnt Rome and blamed it on the Christians, was rearrested, and then around 96 AD, um, not 96, 60, 67, he was beheaded. That's, that's ultimately the end, end of Paul. Paul does die a martyr's death at the hand of Nero. Uh, but at, th at this moment, 
uh, he, he gets an opportunity to continue to spread and share uh, the gospel once again after this. I also believe that Paul ends it uh, to highlight that the gospel work was accomplished. That at the very end of the book, we see the fulfillment of the very first statement in the book. In Acts chapter 1, when it, in verse 8 where it says, And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so at the beginning chapter of Acts, Jesus commissions the apostles and says, You are going to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And at the end of Acts, we have Paul in Rome, which is known as the ends of the earth in that day. And he is preaching the gospel. Even though he's a prisoner, he's preaching it boldly and without hindrance. The gospel prevails. I think the book of Acts tells us that the gospel prevails. How many of you are glad to know that you are part of a of the church of Jesus Christ that preaches the good news of the gospel and the gospel will prevail. And there is nothing or no one that will stop the gospel from being proclaimed until Jesus comes back. We get to be a part of that story. How many of y'all think that's a pretty good team to be on? Amen. We win. The gospel accomplishes the mission. And so we have that, uh, that final end note. Before we... Uh, get back to that uh, let's look at this this interaction that Paul has so one of the first things that Paul does when he gets to Rome uh, it's one reason why I like Paul so much he's a man of action he doesn't sit around and and wait he, he gets things done and within three days as three days after he got to Rome he calls for the for the Jewish leaders to come now it was his practice when he went to a to a new city he would go where first and preach the gospel to the synagogue. Well, he's a prisoner, so he can't go to the synagogue, so he brings the synagogue to him. And he invites them to come, and, uh, and he wants to be able to share with them and witness and testify to them. Now, when Paul was traveling to Rome, remember, uh, it was in late September, early October. It was not the time that you should be traveling. And Paul tried to warn them, saying, we shouldn't be traveling at this time. But they didn't listen. They had all the shipwreck and all that. Well, they end up in Rome. Uh, the Jews in Jerusalem had not yet made that voyage. And, uh, and word that Paul was in Rome hadn't gotten there yet. And so he calls for the Jews to come. And he's like, uh, you may have heard, and, and they may have been saying this about me, but I want to tell you why I'm really here. They're like, oh, we, we didn't even, we didn't, hadn't heard about that. But we have heard about this sect that's stirring up all kinds of mess. Now, we do realize that the church was already in existence before Paul got to Rome. There were already Christians. There was already churches established. When Paul wrote his uh, letter to Romans, he was writing to the church at Rome. So there were already Christians there. And remember, the, the Jews saw them as, as, as this sect, as this wayward group of people that was corrupting uh, Judaism. And so they say, yeah, we would like to hear about this sect uh, that's causing all of these problems. We'd love to hear your views of, of that. Now, I want to highlight three uh, instances when Paul talks about why he wants to talk with them. Look at verse 20. And if you have a Bible and you have it out, if you want to underline it or put an asterisk beside of it, uh, I would ask you to underline or, or highlight where he says, It is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. So when he brings his, the, the fellow Jews together and he begins explaining to them why he's been arrested, he said, the reason why I've been arrested is because of the hope of Israel. Okay, that's important. It's because of that why I'm a prisoner. And so then when they gather together and he begins expounding the scripture, uh, go to verse 23, and it says when he expounded them from morning till evening. So this was, this was a... You know, this is a long meeting time, and he was, he was a prisoner. He had a captive audience there that was there waiting, wanting to hear what he had to say, and he goes from morning until evening, and he expounds to them using the Scripture. This would be the Old Testament. Using the Old Testament, he uses the law of Moses. That would be the first five books of our Bible, and the, and the prophets. 
So using the law of Moses and the prophets, he is expounding to them two things. The kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus. The kingdom of God and he's trying to convince them about Jesus. Put an asterisk by that. So we see that Paul's emphasis is the hope of Israel. That's, he says, that's why I'm in, I'm in prison. And then when he comes and he starts explaining to them, he's trying to persuade them and convince them about the kingdom of God and about the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he's doing this and as he's preaching to them and teaching to them and unfolding uh, the, the scripture and pointing them to the Messiah and to the hope of what they've been looking for all along, there are some that hear and respond. And there's others that do not. And this is the truth and the reality about the gospel. The gospel always accomplishes. It always accomplishes. For some, it softens and breaks their heart. Others, it hardens. The Holy Spirit, he's the great evangelist, and he massages hearts And he brings dead hearts to life. And for some, when they hear the gospel, uh, they will respond and, and say, Jesus, save me. And they'll be cut to the heart, as we've seen throughout the book of Acts. And there's others that when they hear the gospel, they get hardened by the gospel. They get hardened by the fact that the gospel says that they're a sinner in need of a savior. And they clench their fist at God and they, and they, they, they reject the good news. And they, they say, I don't need to repent. And their heart gets, heart gets hardened. And this morning, I would ask you to check your heart. I don't know everyone's spiritual situation here. I don't know if you're a believer or you're not a believer. I know many of you all are believers. Many profess to be believers. But in your heart, have you been cut to the heart of the point where you've realized that you're a sinner in need of saving by God's grace? And I would ask that don't harden your heart. If the Holy Spirit convicts you, don't don't harden your heart, the Bible says, for today is the day of salvation because he will speak and he will invite and, he, and, the, and the invitation is out that you can be a part of the kingdom of God. Sad reality is there will be some who respond and some who won't. If the apostle Paul, what he preaches, can't persuade everyone that hears him to be saved, I know I won't be able to persuade any of you all to be saved. But I know the Holy Spirit will speak. And if you will listen and call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Amen? So let your heart hear what the Spirit says today. Because there were some that missed it. They heard the same message. Some received the kingdom. Some received salvation. Some received the truth of who Jesus was. And some did not. And then Paul quotes from Isaiah. And this is when... They just, they just turn on him and they say, okay, we're done from here. And he quotes Isaiah and he says, rightly did the Holy Spirit say, he's, he's saying, Isaiah was exactly correct. That to go to this people and say, you will indeed hear but never understand, you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. How dangerous it is to have a heart that grows dull. And with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and turn, that I would heal them. You hear that? Don't close your eyes. Don't stop your ears. Listen to what the Holy Spirit says. He says, you all will not listen. I will go to the Gentiles, for they will listen. And it ends by saying that Paul here... Is what he, he can welcome pe- people come in and go as in his quarters. For two years, at his own expense, he welcomes all who comes to him. And he's proclaiming, now look at verse 31, put another asterisk in your Bible. He's proclaiming the what? 
the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's doing this with all boldness and without hindrance. He's talking about the kingdom of God and he's teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. Here, in three different times, we are told that Paul says, it's because of the hope of Israel that I'm in this chain. He expounds to them the kingdom of God and tries to convince them about Jesus. And it ends by telling us that what he's doing and what he's preaching is the kingdom of God and he's talking to people about Jesus. Now, where did Paul get his message? Where did Paul get the information of why he should preach what he preached? What is the book of Acts about? In Acts chapter 1, verse 3, it says that he presented himself alive to them. This is Jesus. He presented himself alive to the disciples after suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the what? Kingdom of God. Well, that, that's Jesus. Jesus is speaking about the kingdom of God. In Acts chapter 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the what? Kingdom of God and the, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. When Paul was in Lystra, Acts 14, 21, when they had preached the gospel to the city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the what? Kingdom of God. Paul in Ephesus in Acts 19, 8. And he entered the synagogue, and for three months he spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about what? The kingdom of God. You see that? The message of the kingdom was issued by Jesus himself. Luke chapter 4, verse 43. Now, Luke wrote the book of Luke, right? And Luke wrote the book of Acts. And so keep the theme, in Luke's gospel, Luke's gospel, Luke, when Jesus is preaching, he uses the terminology kingdom of God. Acts chapter, I mean, Luke chapter 4, verse 30, 43. This is Jesus. But he said to them, this is Jesus speaking, I must preach the good news of the one kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. Because I was sent to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. Luke uses the term kingdom of God 26 times before Luke chapter 19, verse 11. Now, the reason why I'm highlighting that is this. When, when Jesus spoke of the kingdom of God, this was message to the people of Israel. What was, Paul said, I am in chains for the hope of what? Hope of Israel. He said, the reason why I've been arrested, that's what he told the Jews, is because of the hope of Israel. Israel was called a kingdom of priests. That God had formed the nation of Israel to be a kingdom that would bear witness and light to the Gentiles so that his glory would be declared all throughout the earth. They didn't do that. And so Jesus comes in. Now Jesus is the promised seed from Abraham. And so when Paul speaks in Galatians, Paul says the true Jew is not the one that's been circumcised in flesh, but the true Jew is the one that has been circumcised in the heart. So those who are in Christ are the true people of Israel. And so when Jesus comes preaching the kingdom of God, there is there's something breaking forth. There's something new happening. The kingdom didn't come the way the Jews were hoping it to come. They were looking for a physical kingdom. They were waiting for King David to come back in and set up the, the, the rule and reign to wipe out the Roman Empire and to set up a physical kingdom. But Jesus came and he brought a different kingdom. He brought a kingdom... That was not of this world. He brought a kingdom 
that in one sense it is here and now, but in another sense it is not yet and future. And so Jesus would make statements like this. Behold, the kingdom of God is, is in your midst. Because uh, he's speaking about himself and what he's about to do. But yet there's still a future expectation of the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. And so in Luke chapter 19, verse 11, after 26 times he's been preaching about the kingdom of God, it says, And they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because... He was near to Jerusalem, and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So they're looking for an immediate kingdom to get established. Okay, And so Jesus tells them a parable about about the the talents, that, that there's a time lapse there, there's a time gap there. In Luke chapter 22, verse 14, it says, And when the hour came... He reclined at table and the apostles with him. This is the Lord's Supper, when the Lord's Supper is instituted. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. When... Jesus was brought before Pilate. John's gospel records these words. Jesus said, and he answered him, My kingdom is what? Not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. So in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, So when they had come together, this is before Jesus ascends to the Father to sit at their right hand where he is presently. So when they had come together, they asked him, they asked Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? You see that? What what are they still thinking? They're thinking that, that Jesus is going to bring that physical kingdom Now, is it at this time that you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And and watch how Jesus responds. What does he say? He says, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. He tells them, he says, you don't worry about when the kingdom finally invades. What you need to be about is worried about being my witness to the ends of the earth. We as Christian people, our job is to be a witness for Jesus. Amen? Our job is to witness that Jesus is the Savior of the world. That we preach the good news of a coming kingdom. There is a reality that the kingdom is here now and it resides in the hearts of believers. The Holy Spirit rules and reigns in the hearts of his believers, but it's not in the here and now in the physical world. This world is filled with sin and corruption and many of us see all the uh, the things that go on, all of the devastation, the, the, the fighting, the wars, the, the hunger. The th- and we wonder, what, how can we fix it? How can we fix all the problems of the world? How many of you all ever look and, and just watch the news and then you get depressed? Anybody? I mean, you just you watch the news, and it's like this person kills this person, and this person rapes this person, and then, then we got war going on, we got hunger going on. I mean, you, just, you see all this stuff, and you're like, uh, you know, all this hate going on. It's like, how do we fix it? Is it the church's job to fix it? What is the mission of the church? Because there's a debate going on of what is the gospel. 
And what is the purpose of the church? Is the purpose of the church to fix all the social problems in the world? I would say no. The purpose of the church is to preach the good news of the gospel and the kingdom of God. The way that we're going to change the world is through the power of the gospel. It is the power of the gospel that changes the human heart. No social program, no no, uh, reconciliation seminar, nothing is going to fix a problem. But what's going to fix a problem is when the Holy Spirit comes and changes a heart and converts someone that was dead, that's now alive, that once was filled with hate, now is filled with the love of Christ, that the gospel message is that we need a Savior because we are sinners and that we can only be fixed and redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Education can't save us. A government can't save us. A program can't save us. There is nothing that this world offers that will fix any problem. No politician, no one, but the one named Jesus who died for our sin. And so what we've got to do... And so what our mission is as a church is to preach the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. What have we seen the book of Acts about? They've been preaching Jesus, him crucified, and he rose again so that you might be forgiven and set free. So that the Holy Spirit can live in you and rule and reign in your heart and the kingdom of God can be in you and and, and until the future kingdom does come, there is a hope of a future kingdom. Jesus is the entry into that kingdom. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except how? Through me. I am the door. Jesus is the entryway, he is the passageway, he is the only way by which you can enter the kingdom of God and have any type of hope for the future. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is foundational for our faith. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We're even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Do you see how important Easter is to the Christian faith? Do you, do you realize how vital that the bodily resurrection of Jesus, how important that is to the Christian message? If Jesus didn't rise from the grave, there is no Christianity. If he didn't get out of that tomb, it's pointless He he even goes on further to say in verse 19, if in Christ, now watch this, this is a powerful statement for a generation who loves this world. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. What Paul is saying is that If Christianity only gives us hope for this life only, we're to be pitied. So the atheist, they shouldn't mock and ridicule us. They should feel sorry for us if there is no resurrection. If we have hope in this life only... If if there's no resurrection, if there's no future kingdom, if the kingdom of God is just here and now, then when we die, it's over. He says, how miserable that is. We're wasting our time. Amen? You're wasting your time. I'm wasting my time. I'm foolish (laughs) preaching that there is a God who raised Jesus from the dead if he didn't do it. We're all wasting our time. Well, we'd been better off going hunting today. 
if there was no resurrection of the dead. This is why this is so important. Watch. Look at verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, and by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God. When he delivers the kingdom to God. To God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. There is a future kingdom coming, there is a resurrection of the dead. That is the hope of the Christian life. We've all had the experience of losing someone that we love. We've all had someone close to us that, that, that we've loved and that have, that's passed on. And, and some of you have experienced that when the person you loved was a believer. And some of you have experienced that when that person you loved was not a believer. And your experience during that moment was different. The one that you knew was a child of God. There was a blessed hope that came over you in the midst of your sorrow. Because number one, you knew this. Their soul was in, was with the Lord. Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. However, there, there's the reality that we know their body is still in the grave. Right? We see their body. We pass by their body. The Christian hope is that that body that's placed in the grave one day will be resurrected with a glorified body. And that we will be with Jesus forever and ever and ever and his kingdom will have no end. There is a future kingdom coming. There is a king. His name is Jesus. He's bringing a kingdom and there's a new heaven. There's new earth. Now listen, I think we have a problem with loving this world too much. We love this world too much and we put too much energy into this life. And we're trying to make life all about the here and now. When if we read our Bible and we understand what's going to happen, this world's going up in flames. God himself will will destroy this world. And he's going to make all things new. So there is nothing, nothing in your 401k that goes with you to heaven. There's no vehicle going to heaven with you. Your house isn't going to heaven with you. Your jewelry isn't going to heaven with you. Nothing that you own is going to heaven with you. Nothing about this world is going to last. So why do we love it so much? You know how we need to view ourselves? We're pilgrims. We're missionaries. We're on a short-term mission trip. Even if we live to be 95, that's not long. The older I get, the more I realize that uh, getting older, it goes by fast. We're on a short-term mission trip. We're only here for a little while. This is not our home. The kingdom of God now lives inside of us. But that's not the the final fulfillment of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is coming. There's a real kingdom coming when he brings us to new life and we enter into his presence forever. There is a kingdom coming that is the blessed hope of the believer. And that's what we long for. That's what we hope for. That's what we live for. We live for that kingdom, not this kingdom. Hebrews, the author of Hebrews, says that Abraham, and they were given the promise of a land. 
I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing this, not word for word. But as they were hoping for this land, it says that they weren't longing for that land, that piece of property over in Jerusalem. It says, no, they were, they were longing for the better land, the heavenly land. Because if it was just that piece of property, they could have gotten back into that land. But they were longing for the eternal city. Do you all, how many of you all long for that eternal heavenly city? Do you live that way? Do you live with your purpose knowing that this life is temporary and what matters is what you do for God? That's what really matters, how you live your life to glorify God, how you live your life to be a witness. Acts 1 8, you shall be my witnesses. That's our task. As a Christian, our task is to be a witness to the gospel of Christ. There is a future kingdom. Death has a way of getting some people's attention, does it not? Remember Jesus? He was mocked, ridiculed, beaten, crucified. Before they crucified him on, his cro on the cross, they mocked him as a king. You need a crown? Here's your crown. And they smashed a crown of thorns on his head. You need a scepter, here's your scepter. You need a robe, here's your robe. And they mocked him and they ridiculed him. And as he was hanging on the tree, there were people who'd come by and they would, they would mock him and say, if you're a king, come down off that. Save yourself. If you're a king. And there was two criminals that was crucified beside him. And it says one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying are you not the Christ save yourself and us but the other rebuked him saying do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation and we indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds but this man he's done nothing wrong I said, do you fear God we're here because we're guilty. He's not. And notice what he says to Jesus. And he says to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? He recognized Jesus was a king. That he was the hope of Israel. That he was the promised one. That he was the one that they all were longing for. And in him is life. And he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This morning, I don't know if you know Christ as Lord and Savior. But I'm begging you this morning that you would recognize Jesus for who he is. That he is a true king. And that he has a kingdom. And he's made a way for you to enter the kingdom. And that's through what he did on the cross for you. And that if you will receive Jesus and ask him and place your faith in him, he will save you and he will get you into his kingdom and you will be with him forevermore. So this morning, I don't know where you stand. Are you in the kingdom or out of the kingdom? But if you're out of the kingdom today, I pray you step into the kingdom through Jesus Christ who is the King and Lord and Savior. Amen. Let's pray. Father.